Welcome everyone to the Ananta Aspen Center's Road Ahead. This is a dialogue, a public dialogue with uh, internationally known uh, Kamala Nayan Bajaj Fellows of the uh, Aspen Center. <clears throat> We're very excited to have three uh, really incredible people with us today who are going to talk about the road ahead, what they have experienced in the last few months of this uh, coronavirus crisis, uh, how they are responding to it, and what it has taught them about what the world could be like uh, in, the, in the time to come once we've gotten back to some sense of normalcy. You are all uh, on a webinar, so you, uh, you will know that there's a, a one way to dialogue with us is there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you enter your questions there as you go along, I'll incorporate that into the discussion. Those of you uh, who are joining us on Facebook, Facebook Live, there is a comment section there as well, and you're welcome to enter comments and questions there, and we'll include that into the discussion. So let me introduce our three uh, uh, um, conversationalists today. One is Govind Etiraj. Govind is a fellow of the Kamal Nayan Bajaj Fellow Class One. He's part of the Aspen Global Leadership Network. He's been a television and print journalist covering business for over 25 years. He's an entrepreneur in media and has started Boom India Spent and Facts Checker. He's, uh, the whole idea here is to, uh, for transparency and accuracy and making sure that we have, uh, we can separate fake news from real news. That was a venture he started as part of the Aspen Global Leadership Network, and he was named one of the McNulty Prize laureates for that venture. We also have Manoj Kumar with us. He's a fellow of the Kamalayan Bajaj Fellowship Class Two, also a moderator and member of the Aspen Global Leadership Network. He's a CEO of Nandi Foundation, uh, which is the one of India's largest nonprofits, um, impacting over six million lives and the, uh, the services covering from girls' education, unemployed youth, and working with small farmers. Um, he, had a he has a venture that uh, is working with 100,000 tribal um, lives uh, in the hills of Araku <clears throat> and helping them come out of poverty, also planting trees. The organization has planted 25 million trees in the Araku region. He was named by Financial Times London as 20, one of 25 people to watch in India. And he's also a McNulty Prize Laureate in recognition for the uh, venture that he launched with Araku Coffee. Uh, and we have Sri Kumar Misra. He's a fellow of the Kamalayan Bajaj Fellowship Class 4, a member of the Global Leadership Network. He's the founder of Milk Mantra, a startup that works with uh, solving the trust deficit between consumers and food. He's a leader and practitioner of uh, purposeful business, widely covered in global media, such as the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Fortune, um, and he's been part of the case studies at Stanford and IMA in uh, the way of this new age transformational business. <clears throat> now, milk, milk Mantra has an effect on a third of a million rural lives um, it, with, its eth with its ethical sourcing program. And his premium brand has been just one of the most innovative by Fast Company and featured among uh, the growing businesses in Asia by uh, Financial Times. He's also a McNulty Prize laureate uh, for his venture Milk Mantra. So I'm excited to have the, the three of them, uh, fellows of the, uh, of the center, to talk to us about how they have uh, been responding to this crisis. The way I thought we'd do this is we'll spend uh, five, six minutes each uh, with each of you just opening up and telling us what it was like when you first heard about the coronavirus, the crisis as it was happening, how you responded as the virus washed onto our shores, and then we'll hear about where you are today. And then in the Q&A, we'll talk about the road ahead. Does that sound good? Govind, let's start with you. What was it like when you first heard about this? Yeah, I think, uh, thanks, James, and uh, pleasure to be here. And thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's not very clear when it exactly started. I mean, we have various dates, but we do know broadly that the first signs of uh, coronavirus started trickling in January at, at a time. I mean, and we started looking at it and uh, started trying to understand what was happening. The second thing that's happening is, I mean, we, are in, we, we do two things. We, uh, we do data journalism. We use data to tell stories in areas like health and education and environment. And the second thing is we bust fake news and, and misinformation. And uh, in both cases, one being health and the other being misinformation, uh, clearly there was uh, this, the early signs of, uh, of a response that we uh, had to uh, start putting together. Now, uh, I, Unlike maybe other, uh, you know, uh, misinformation is created by just about anything. Any event happens, uh, a whole bunch of people, some with design and architecture, some uh, uh, spontaneously jump in and, and start disseminating uh, stuff. 
uh, and and the dissemination sometimes when it's architected can be uh, can be substantial and go to go into the inboxes or WhatsApp uh, uh, queues of millions or even tens of millions of people. So uh, the, what what we started seeing was that uh, as the WHO then subsequently defined it an infodemic. Uh, even as they were defining it as a pandemic, uh, they started uh, calling it an infodemic or a misinfodemic. So, which means for the first time, perhaps, uh, unlike maybe other events, we were dealing with two sim problems simultaneously. We were dealing with the public health crisis, and we were also dealing with a public information crisis, and we continue to. Uh, as this uh, evolved, I think, so we've approached it in two ways. One is to, uh, you know, go closer to the front lines of medicine and try and understand what's happening in terms of the treatment response, uh, the progression of the disease under India spend. And we're also fighting all the stuff uh, which uh, all of you must have been seeing since uh, February into March, which is all the many cures, uh, all the solutions that people have miraculously dreamt of. Uh, to fight coronavirus, it could be drinking uh, garlic water, it could be, uh, you know, doing a, a sneeze test to find out if your lungs are fine, it could be, uh, uh, you know, and even at some very bizarre and most recent levels, uh, ingesting uh, disinfectant. So, uh, and, and these are things that uh, we, we may laugh about today, but many people uh, take seriously. And, and the bigger problem is that uh, there are two bigger problems, which again is sort of been highlighted by this crisis. One is the changing nature of the disease and its progression. So in the early days, everyone said that, let's say you cannot take a certain kind of medicine or you could take a certain kind of medicine, hydroxychloroquine, right? And, and the thing is, we don't know because tests are still uh, happening. People are still trying to understand the spread of the disease. People are still trying to understand what's happening with patients. Uh, and within patients, we don't know whether uh, the early uh, data which said that older people are more susceptible is uh, still holding because now it's clear that younger people are susceptible to uh, early signs said that the disease only progressed via the respiratory tract and the lungs. Now it's clear that other organs are being affected too. So this is something that's progressing. So there is no single needle to say that this is misinformation period. Right. So, uh, so when, so when, and, and, and the overall uh, highway or super highway of information or misinformation that's flowing, everything gets mixed. So the net result is that all of us, uh, people who are trying to counter it are more confused and, uh, uh, or are trying to fight this confusion, which, like I said, merges the reality and the, and the real and the non-real uh, parts. So this is how it's been. Now, uh, uh, where are we today? I think in India, things have evolved a little bit. I mean, some of that misinformation uh, has toned down a little bit, but unfortunately, it's got replaced by a lot of communal, uh, 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 communal, let's say, messaging, pushing, and, and so on. So the overtones have become more communal, and that's sad. But that's what it is currently in India. Uh, but if I look at it globally, I think the challenge still continues to be everything arising out of our inability to understand uh, what this disease is doing and so on. The last part is, and I'll pause after that, is really what does it tell us about us? All this tells us that essentially we are not, despite all our education, and I'm only talking about people who have been had the uh, fortune or the privilege of being educated, it, does, it shows that we are not capable of critical thinking as much as we should be. Uh, it shows that we, are, we tend to believe things at first glance. It, uh, it tells us that despite everything that we've been taught in education, even including in, uh, in, in the pursuit of engineering or science, we tend to jump on things because they appear like uh, uh, solutions to us or they appear, uh, that they, they, uh, they appear like uh, things that might solve the problem that we are facing. Uh, and either because they're simple, I, either they are easy to understand or easy to believe, or it just seems logical from uh, some stretch. So I think, I think these are the two things that, uh, that we have to really focus on. I mean, you know, so the problems will continue. Uh, COVID will at some point go away as a vaccine is found or we, our lives change in order to accommodate for it. But uh, the, the larger challenge of our inability to uh, be uh, or develop sufficient critical thinking about everything that we consume is, is uh, going to remain an issue. Uh, equally, I think, as uh, the, the current uh, wave of misinformation we are seeing in India, the ability of uh, communal and communally tainted uh, uh, information or misinformation and our ability to, in some ways, go back to what are uh, maybe our old uh, beliefs uh, uh, and uh, not so, uh, obviously, not the best beliefs or uh, definitely not positive. I think that's something that uh, we have to work on. And I think many people in the political space have said, too, I mean, there is, there is a virus and there is a communal virus. You know, so we are fighting both, uh, even as the WHO is fighting a pandemic and an infodemic. So I'll pause there. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Roman. Manoj, what about you with uh, the way this uh, virus has 
affected some of the ventures that you're working in? You're working in a lot of areas in the rural communities. Can we talk about how that's changing? Yeah, so um, I want to repeat the fact that you said in the introduction and, and thank you for arranging this, um, Ananta and James, Ananta Center and James. It's, it's wonderful to not only just meet uh, fellow panelists who in this lockdown, but also I'm sure a lot of people who are listening to some of the things that we want to use as a forum to share our views. So the three things that we work at Nandi or I sort of uh, spend my time, one is to work with girls education and the other is with youth unemployment. So technically these are classroom group activities, which we had to shut down the moment the lockdown started. So other than sort of almost surreptitiously and very discreetly and with distance, apart from communicating the messaging right, as Govin said, we, we work in areas which are very, very uh, potentially communally chargeable areas. I mean, we work in border areas of UP, we work in Darjeeling, we work in Dharavi, uh, in Mumbai, uh, and we we therefore used our 6,000 odd women, young women, uh, frontline workforce to communicate to them about what's going on. They, you know, we what really happened with this lockdown is a total communication lockdown with the the masses and the communities that I work with. Um, they, from a variety of channels that they had in the past they started getting very funneled information. And we saw for the first time, the way people decided to decipher, which is true information and which is, which is false, was completely different from logical thinking we had. Many went to religious leaders, many went to WhatsApp. And, and to disseminate that and to go and communicate to them what they should do and they shouldn't uh, was our first challenge from that point of view, and which we had to do very gently. But our real focus of work was in the space with farmers and uh, agriculture. Uh, I say this because uh, in, we, we have three large areas of work, one in the Eastern Ghats in Vishakapatnam district, which goes up to thousand villages we work. Then in heart of uh, suicide prone belt of Indian agriculture, which is Vidarbha. So we work in Varda, uh, that was the second. And third, we work uh, in urban Delhi outskirts, uh, growing vegetables. So three distinct large uh, work spaces with farming and farmers became our focus to look at. Um, they were not to be locked down because they were growing essential food, uh, which was needed. Two, there were a lot of challenges they were facing as such and uncertainty. So we needed to be with them even more. And thirdly, I will pivot to something that has been a trend for us, which is we felt that while this has been referred to as a pandemic, uh, this had all the sort of what you call um, signs of a natural disaster. Why I say this is we, I, we were part of the tsunami that happened. And in fact, I was part of also the super cyclone way back in 99. Then we had the tsunami. And all this time, the first reaction of everyone is to reach food. And, and uh, hunger is the first thing that hits uh, a, a disaster like this. Because we used to do midday meals for a million children in the past, which we don't do now because we outsourced it to separate organizations across the country. We used to be at the forefront of distributing food. And I remember post tsunami, we even set up shop in Andaman and Nicobar Islands, which was most affected. What we learned over these years and now what we are seeing is that because of lockdown and because of the social distancing, the food distribution by and large became very supervised by the police uh, and the government and politicians. And the role of NGOs became very minimized. And we felt the, the feedback we were even getting from the government agencies was, you know, please prepare yourself to be available for post relief measure. Once the food system and the lockdown is over, that's where we would need more of your work. So what we ended up shifting is not to get into food distribution, although it was very tempting to do something for migrant workers, especially stranded. Uh, we figured out it was very difficult to do in scale. So we have started moving to galvanizing vegetables and fruits that we already grow, as well as cereals and pulses, to reach markets in some form or the other. This, this was going to help the farmers to ensure that their food is sold, 
because many of them we were we have been constantly listening stories about farmers complaining they cannot they cannot supply to any market their food and they had to dump it especially the perishable ones and second was to ensure that this food reaches markets in a manner that's possible but i would later take this discussion to say that post this lockdown i think nothing would be um, an exaggeration if i say that food itself will change in the way we look at it food will no more be a matter of calories food will become a matter of nutrition food will become medicine food will become what is going to define immunity 70% of covid deaths in a recent report that i was looking at had was traceable to immune 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 deficiencies that eventually led to the succumbing of the um, life so immunity like never before is going to be discussed nutrition like never before is going to be discussed and i think uh, personally this has been um, a battle within nandi and with the team that i work which is to relook at food from calories relook at health from weight loss and muscle gain to immunity to how can you resist yourself to diseases and enough studies are now beginning to say it all starts with soil it all the the biomes in your soil will reflect exactly what is the biomes in your gut now probiotic which is what sri is doing and and is familiar with in the milk field is basically mirroring what what has been the possible science in agriculture so i would say that this is a wake up call this is an opportunity for us to relook at the role farmers play for us to relook at how we treat soil how we treat i mean till now because the delhi air pollution we discussed atmosphere trust me we will now discuss rhizosphere rhizosphere is the activity that happens around the root roots of plants and crops that's going to be discussed and this leads to what i like to offer to the world which is please begin to have the humility that life below the soil is far more important than life above the soil i know it's controversial to say that because we are all about the soil but our life is sustained by the microbes beneath the soil and so a whole range of opportunities open up for us to look at food differently for us to respect where the food comes from for us you know to to paraphrase michael pollan it it's not any more you are what you eat it's going to be you are what you eat eats um so we will start discussing what is plant food you know what does what do we feed plants you know do do we do we do we even give colostrum to them how do you you know make the soil regenerative all these new science is going to come out and i am glad from pure chemistry we will have some discussion on microbiology we'll have some discussion on life sciences and and a uh, uh, fields that were not so sexy for even students will open up you know uh, virologists uh, immunologists um, um microbiologists they will become suddenly relevant uh, people who will look up i was just reading again bill bryson's book on the human body you know and how little the occupants know about it um the fact that we know almost nothing about microbes mm. the knowledge of microbial uh, wisdom for human species is almost 0.0001% it is scary and and suddenly i what is funny is as govin said all of us are experts on this virus now uh, you know in reality it's just the opposite but it goes back and i want to bring this discussion back and i'll stop here which is we will need to be the food generation and we will have to look at food um very seriously if you want to change everything and what i like best is food is eventually what defines our culture so here is a chance to reinvent culture too i'll pause now great thank you manoj thank you um uh, sri let's talk about uh, your experience and and especially the change in the businesses that you change in the business that you had to do to respond to what the crisis had uh, brought forth you know thanks james and uh, wonderful uh, uh, being here so i'll just uh, probably wind uh, back to mid march i remember we had the last uh, board meeting of the company around uh, that time for the, the last for the year and uh, as usual apart from the review we also discussed the plans for the next year 
and uh, the year had uh, uh, panned out pretty well. Um, obviously, from February onwards, uh, there was this whole um, issue of COVID uh, bubbling under, but not yet surfaced in India uh, fully. Uh, and the plans had been developed uh, in that context. Even mid-March, just prior to everything happening, uh, we knew that there would be some impact. Um, but the, it was a good board meeting, and uh, there were some questions around how things would be impacted and that things might change. Within a week of that, everything changed. So a whole year's plan, the numbers that we were kind of looking at to end the year with March suddenly dropped off the cliff and we were uh, in completely uncharted uh, territory, especially being a, an essential services company, we had to keep running, which was a sort of a much bigger challenge, uh, I felt, uh, at least in the initial uh, days of our uh, operations through the lockdown, continuing uh, operations as is. So I'll share uh, some of the uh, sort of learnings uh, or thoughts uh, we've been having uh, through from there till now. I think firstly, fortunately, as things were uh, evolving, around mid-March, we did some amount of uh, business continuity planning that what if this happens? And we sent out people working from home. We kind of fine-tuned our uh, uh, workflow tech stack. So enabled 40% of the office staff to get back and work. I think that has uh, helped us immensely because within a few days, the lockdown kind of was thrust upon us and we were able to transition smoothly as far as running operations uh, was concerned. Of course, there were many other issues. Suddenly within two days, I found uh, 20 of our people at Milk Mantra, our channel partners sitting in police stations and we had to deal with all sorts of random issues to uh, uh, you know, get things uh, back to normalcy, assure people. But I saw a couple of things uh, emerging. So firstly, I think uh, it, it was a question of um, a conflict uh, in leadership. The, the, the morality of uh, the decisions that we were uh, taking and every decision had a people impact to it. So at one end being an essential service, we had um, you know, people depend on milk, uh, households depend upon uh, milk each and every day. And there are uh, young uh, kids to uh, adults who are absolutely dependent upon that uh, flowing through. So we had consumers and households to balance at one end. And at the other end, uh, uh, we knew the absolute importance of the value chain where uh, tens of thousands of far farmers who are dependent in rural India on the whole flow through happening. And and that especially at such a time when their only income uh, was going to be through this daily supply chain. And in the middle, we had our employees. So it was, uh, it, there was some conflict in the decisions that we had to take internally, uh, you know, sending out people to work. But I think very, very clearly because of the purpose that we had in the DNA of Milk Mantra, everyone uh, stood up. I, uh, we, we haven't come across a single person, either in the front end, back end, in our plants, anywhere who said, you know, I'm, I'm not going to step out and work because of this. People felt that this is this is uh, our role. We need to do it. We had to, as uh, sort of the senior team in the company and as uh, sort of leaders, we had to ensure everybody's safety and communication became the most important thing. As every plan changed as everything uh, that we planned for uh, the next one month as a containment plan got changed within two days we realized that you know the horizon of planning was not no longer even a month it was uh, say three days to a, a week at most so we planned accordingly and and i think it hinged very importantly on over communicating so we established procedures across uh, the supply chain, not just communicating with, uh, with our own people, but externally uh, with the tens of thousands of farmers and even to the households, which our staff would be sort of, uh, interacting with. And I think that communication has been going on and that, that's been a very important uh, uh, sort of part of uh, this uh, maintaining and managing uh, this. Of course, I mean, both uh, Govind and uh, Manoj spoke about uh, the, the correctness of the communication so that it that itself becomes a challenge. Sometimes we wonder uh, 
you know, what's right, what's wrong, but then we have to wade through uh, that. And whilst we were doing uh, this, we felt that plans had to become very granular. So we put together a crisis containment uh, uh, dashboard, which was a, a, a one page dashboard with all key metrics that the senior team of the company could look at and decide on um, whether uh, you know, pursuing a certain course of action is taking it, uh, making it more worse or is uh, enabling things to move forward in the right way. So that crisis containment dashboard, which was our internal tool of, uh, of managing even, even now, has been of uh, immense uh, uh, use to us. So with all this, we've come thus far, but where are we uh, today? I feel that uh, as, we, as, we, as we near and uh, exit from this lockdown to get into another lockdown, um, we still do not have a sight of uh, a lockdown exit plan. I think that's, that's uh, very important for everyone across uh, um, any business, in our personal lives, in our professional lives, and especially how some of the very important value chains uh, that, that, that impact people's lives will work and uh, Manoj spoke extensively about the uh, food chain, which is one of the very important ones. So our inability to model and scenario plan at this stage is, is a handicap, I would say. We still uh, do not have uh, that uh, critical thinking ability, nor do we have uh, great guidance um, in terms of what's happening around the world to take uh, learnings from. So there is a clear issue around how well we're able to model things out. And that's something that everyone has to have uh, much focus on. I feel that the way businesses will run in the future will be very different. And that's something which I think uh, we, we will explore uh, further uh, in this uh, conversation. There are two uh, dimensions to it. I think one is a more shorter, medium term, look at how businesses will function. And that ends not just something which is very uh, sort of operational in its nature. There, there will be fundamental differences in the way people will live their lives and how businesses uh, will operate uh, um, as we move forward. That's a more shorter, medium term uh, impact and how things will pan out. But more importantly, I feel, this is a great opportunity to make long pending changes in the way shareholder capitalism has been working. This is our opportunity to not just be flow and manage the new normal, but actually have the ability, we have the ability to shape the new normal. And if we could do that in a very purposeful way and reset, press that reset button on capitalism and shape that outcome, then that would be a, something that one positive thing that would emerge from this opportunity, which has been uh, thrust on us. Great, thank you, Sri. Um, so there's a couple of things I wanna start with you on. One, uh, before we get to this question about uh, the way shareholder capitalism needs to change is about communication. You mentioned um, communication was very important and remains to be very important, but you're also in a situation where your ability to predict and see ahead is actually quite limited. You're working day to day, three days ahead and so on. So how do you communicate when actually you know less? Yes, it is, it, it is a sort of a, a, a challenge that we, we're kind of uh, grappling with. So what we are communicating more about is I think the people dimension uh, of this challenge as opposed to sort of the business uh, dimensions of the challenge. The way people live their lives, their uh, emotional health, uh, their um, uh, you know, how, how, how people interact, not just uh, professionally, but also how, how they kind of uh, uh, are able to manage their lives in a better way. Those are the dimensions that we are communicating on much, uh, much further. That's, that's one area of, uh, I think uh, where uh, um, we feel there is, there is a necessity uh, to do so. And for example, we've tried to uh, enable online uh, sessions uh, with uh, counselors or uh, psychoanalysts, uh, psychoanalyst advisors, for example, for, for our team, whoever would like to avail that. Because if this challenge is uh, sort of posing 
different sorts of challenges to different people. People are reacting it, to it in different ways. The other, the other dimension of communication and where I feel over communication has been absolutely essential and has helped us is as we've kind of moved through this whole crisis, in some sense, not being exposed or not seeing the kind of uh, devastating impact uh, COVID has had in uh, some other regions, some other countries, is also making people feel that we are probably uh, not as exposed or that we, we're uh, sort of uh, okay to move ahead with, with uh, whatever we were doing earlier. Mm -hmm. So it becomes absolutely imperative to keep on uh, re-emphasizing the point that this is not over yet and these are the things that we need to be doing and of course there is a challenge of what we need to do. Um, we have to be clear about that but on those areas that we are perfectly sure about say social distancing, uh, so say, uh, you know, wearing masks, a simple thing like that, for example, there, were, there was so much confusion earlier that if you are not yourself uh, a carrier, then you should, there's no point wearing a mask. These simple things need to be uh, retreated. So I feel communication on the people dimension has been uh, extremely important uh, through this uh, phase and will continue to uh, do so. Govind, let me come to you. You mentioned uh, that uh, news has become uh, more granular, that uh, uh, there's a lot more uh, misinformation, but also misinformation at a time when, frankly, we don't even know what is right and what is wrong because everything is changing so fast. You tie into that something that Sri talked about, which is there's higher levels of anxiety amongst populations and our need to communicate. And anxiety drives the need to get information and will, frankly, you know, latch on to anything, <laughs> you know, as news. Um, is that looking ahead, does it, is this the way it's going to be for some time that there's going to be so much change, so rapidly changing that anxiety will continue, will keep latching on. And if so, how do we, how do we sift? You've mentioned this issue about the necessity for critical thinking. How do we get there? Yeah, I mean, it's something that we ask ourselves almost every day as we see the next forward, uh, which I can assure you, there were about 10 uh, 10 very viral posts just in the last half an hour that we've been talking, uh -huh. uh, including that Bombay is going to shut down uh, till the 18th of May, of which there is still no official uh, statement, but there have been several proposals. But So that's how things spread, right? Because obviously there is some fear and concern that uh, the city of Bombay is going to extend its lockdown and the data is also showing that. But till a decision comes, we should wait. So what's happening here? People are clearly jumping to the gun, uh, jumping the gun and arriving at a conclusion, uh, spreading screen grabs of, uh, or maybe even doctored screen grabs of some television uh, channel, and everyone starts believing it. And then before you know, uh, you know, the whole uh, administration is trying to fight that, uh, saying that, no, listen, uh, you know, we've not taken a decision. We will take a decision maybe on the 2nd of May or the 1st of May when we are closer. And that's exactly what happened the last time because uh, administration, and let's give them credit, uh, whether it's federal or state, uh, they want to look at the data first. Uh, look at the last possible uh, data point and time that they can, uh, you know, start assessing before taking a decision. There's no point taking a decision for 10 days later that, uh, you know, uh, today. So anyway, so, uh, and, 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 the, and, and that's exactly how it spreads and that's exactly how it, uh, uh, it, it sort of is, it, it gets consumed. So will this change? Uh, no, it will not change. Uh, uh, only, I mean, I think COVID has only made it worse because we are all affected by it in a way that we have never been affected by anything so singularly across the world at the same time. Mm -hmm. So to that extent, this is unique. But otherwise, uh, uh, we, will we continue to uh, believe things which are not true? I, we definitely will. Uh, will. Will that uh, over time increase? That I'm not sure. Because obviously, there's a lot of fight back going on. There's a lot of technology that's going in trying to uh, stop the problem. You know, we work with Facebook, for example. And when we uh, you know, put a strike on a post that's going viral on Facebook, then Facebook suppresses its distribution. So, and millions of people who may have otherwise seen something that's false will not see it anymore. So there will be solutions like that. Uh, I think uh, at, at a very uh, micro level, almost a lot of schools are taking uh, the initiative to teach children about uh, consuming information off the internet. This is not just about information and misinformation. It's about saying, how do you consume the internet? How do you deal with the internet? You know, even you and I, if we had a catch in my, if I had a catch in my back and I went and started Googling and I found webmd.com, which says that there are eight causes for that catch in the back, ranging from a sprain to bone marrow cancer, right? And what will I believe? I will obviously, uh, you know, believe, uh, you know, I mean, bone marrow cancer as, as a possibility. So I need to be trained, therefore, or at least self-trained that I should not be going to webmd.com as a first, this thing. Or even if I do it, I only do it to educate myself, but go to my general physician or doctor and then get 
uh, proper medical advice about what my condition is. And, and I can, you know, keep going on. But the thing is, so I have to train myself. I mean, if I'm older, there's no one, it's no one's business to sit and explain to me, uh, you know, how things should be consumed. But if I have children in my home and uh, I mean, as we all do, and I think clearly we should be spending more time with them. Schools are beginning to do that. Uh, in Kerala, for instance, there are, uh, there's a, there are district collectors who've taken effort to uh, run proper curriculum on t- uh, training Kanur. Uh, for training uh, young children and I, I hope many others will pick it up. So, yeah, so the, the battle has to be fought on the demand side. Uh, you know, we are currently fighting most of it on the supply side. Uh, and if, if we fight that on the demand side, then our overall hopefully approach and critical thinking will improve, which will help us as society, not just in the case of fighting specific instances of misinformation. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Manoj, I want to come to you both three and uh, go over in the last set have talked uh, quite a bit about the change and uncertainty that's coming ahead. But in your conversation, you were certain about one thing, which is that uh, the nature of food is going to change. The way we absorb, uh, come to and consume food is going to change. And you mentioned the idea of nutrition. Now, um, today, when I look at a label, let me be like simple, right? I look at a label and it's very clear what it tells me. But you're, you seem to be suggesting that I need to know not just that I need a carrot, but where the carrot comes from, right? Can you speak about how that's going to shift and change both my relationship with my food, but also the supply chain along the way, and bring into it just not only the idea of the, um, of the biome that you mentioned, but also sustainability, because that's a question that's been asked, because that also becomes a, a very important in this discussion. Right? Um, very pertinent question. And so if, James, if you look at um, food, I, I'm, I was remembering when I was growing up, when I, whenever I had to eat apples, it, it was predominantly from Kashmir or Himachal, and, and there was just one type of apple. Today, when I go to buy apples, they ask me, do you want Chilean, New Zealand, or American? And with an American, do you want Gala or, you know, 665? Um, so, and, and, and the ones that are priced like that have become more expensive. And the, the choice people make is either ask the question, is this sweet? Or they ask the question, you know, or they look at, is it looking beautiful and, you know, not tampered? So this is the level of our jurisdiction when we come to choosing food at the moment. Now, from there, what I'm saying is people are going to look at, we, we moved through a time when people said, if you look at label of a food and if you cannot understand what it is written, then probably it's not good for you to eat. You know, that was the best that um, food, food experts brought us to in terms of conscience as a consumer. What I'm saying is that will change from two aspects. One is the ecological and planet aspect. So uh, we have forgotten. I grew up, and I'm sure all of us grew up eating what was seasonally available. Now, you know, with the advent of technology, you can eat any vegetable at any time of the year. In the process, you don't realize whether the avocado is coming from Spain or not. Or, Or can we have a substitute which is locally grown next door? Forget about the carbon emissions of bringing it. But imagine the, the kind of cost that you've added to food in, in getting something that is so exotic to be eaten here. And it doesn't make any sense because there are more people are now discovering kale and goa has probably more vitamins and nutrition than anything else. And, and goa is something we grew up with. So the point of looking at seasonality of foods, understanding the what is grown top, tropologically. I mean, if you take a region, what Punjab grows is different from what Kerala grows. And there was certain wisdom in how we had a relationship with food. And in fact, food was a byproduct of agriculture, which was a way of living, culture. It has changed to farming and economic activity. So what I would say is what this pandemic brought to us, for example, as a learning is, we were just lucky to have started the city movement of foods. And the idea that cities outskirts should grow food rather than wait for all food to come from somewhere else. And so during this pandemic in Delhi, we could regularly supply food for the, our regular food, uh, food buyers because we, we had very limited disruption. Whereas uh, the coffee that I grow in Araku, I've been struggling to reach it to my regular buyers because it was impossible to uh, courier it because it was dependent on courier services, travel. Uh, Sri was struggling with um, logistics itself. So I, I want to bring the fact that locally produced, seasonally produced food is going to be the future. That is as far as the ecology is concerned. As before I come to nutrition and the labeling part, I think we use an acronym and we say food will be defined by what I call the PQR index. 
P stands for is the farmer growing the farmer who is growing it easy or she making profits. If it is not that food is not sustainable and financially viable, you cannot have food anymore produced just on subsidies. Q is what is the quality of the food that the consumer eats? Is it nutrient rich? Is it immunologically relevant? And you know, can this be traceable to where it was grown in terms of knowing where the food came from? And R is the planet part, which is, is the food grown in a regenerative manner? Can that soil be reused? Can the plot of land be reused? Can the seeds be reused? So PQR index to use a mnemonic now uh, will become the determinant of how food will be. Um, and, and I think that's going to be relevant. So it's, we should start asking questions. And as to, to, uh, to James' um, earlier point with uh, Govind, I think we have a responsibility as leaders, as people who have educated, to not just consume food blindly by sheer taste or looks. We need to ask these questions. This will be our first activism to helping farmers, to helping this planet. Ask the question before you eat, before you even ask the price, ask the question, where is this made? Who made it? How was it made? What is inside this? If we can change this, and I'm hoping that this becomes part of learning in schools. I hope children grow up to do it. I don't know if you're aware, in France, they launched a, an app. And all that the app did was you could go and check um, whether this food scored well in terms of all these indices I said. You will not believe, I had friends in Paris call me and said, this is six months before the epidemic outbreak. It said that their children gave up junk food because they would go check the, with the app on the food, what the app score was. And if it was less, they would say, oh my God, we, we, won't, we won't touch this. So the idea of using technology and information to give consumer the information needed on judging food will be a new revolution. And that would be the next one after the mobility apps. It will be judging food on these aspects. And once that happens, I think we will have a new movement. The beauty about this is everyone consumes food. I mean, what I say is irrelevant to people who don't take food at all. Um, mm. I agree. But for everyone else, this is very valid. And you have a role to play. Ask the question. What's the food you eat? Who grows it? How was it grown? How much distance did it travel? And people will be forced to, producers and companies will be forced to put that out there. But I would like for a label not on organic as of now. Hmm. I want a label which says, is, is the farmer who grows this making profit? Yeah. Is, is the far, is, yeah, sorry. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Or, or is this, can you dis disclose what are the nutritional values of this food? And lastly, was this grown in a regenerative, ecologically sustainable manner? I mean, if we can ask these questions, I mean, triple bottom line, what we spoke about should come on to every food that we put in our mouth. And mm -hmm. mindless eating, pun intended, should change. <laughs> Time has come. Yeah, so this PQR model that you talked about requires a different relationship between me as a consumer and the farmer. I mean, today between me and the, and the farmer, there are many, many people, including packaging and everything before it, processing before it comes to me. You're talking about a completely different set of relationships. How do we get to that level of granularity, changing from the, from the person who's making it to, the, to me? So fundamentally, it will, it will also be a function of, as I said, the distance between the farmer and you. Hmm. You know, that's why I'm saying we need to rethink how cities are fed hereafter. Mm -hmm. The over-reliance on cities to be fed by packaged food is one, but which is, which is no connection with the farmers, but also coming from thousands of kilometers is another. So we need to relook at it. And, I, and we have been clamoring for it when the smart city definitions came out. Smart cities, we found whenever we looked at, had no discussion on food, mm -hmm. had no discussion on where the food is coming to the city. It was only about flyovers and roads and mobilities and parks. And, you know, it, it never had basic stuff about food. So I think, for instance, if you look at cities and urbanization is here to stay, we need to find models by which outskirts of cities within 100 kilometers produce most of the basic food you need. And, and if you can create that legislation, those mechanisms by which land is available, I mean, we need agricultural clusters. We created technology parks because it helped export revenue and jobs. We created uh, industrial clusters all throughout. I think it's time for food clusters. It's time for agricultural clusters, farm clusters outside cities. Mm -hmm. Let cities be known by what food is grown near that. You know, that's, that's the change. That's the opportunity waiting for us. Mm -hmm. and, and let's make, you know, the, the rich I met 
so far all wanted and had a farm house that mm-hmm. was the best thing i'm saying it will change to they saying i'm now a farmer let's mm-hmm. make farming sexy let's make big, producing your own food the next big thing and if that becomes a new status which the rich can start i'm telling you we will no more see farmer as somebody who is a bare chested guy plowing in the fields in rural india and about to have the next pesticide to die and you know drink and die because of losses that image should change and that's that's what i'm hoping this covid will bring to us and india with the kind of natural resources you know this james sunshine water rain variety of topography we are poised to show the world how our association with food can change and how we can be leaders in it if there is anything which is going to be made in india it is the food we eat and let's do it thank you thank you um uh, sri uh the this this discussion manu just started about getting closer to between production and consumption right and understanding where things come from uh and you also mentioned the logistics and supply chain changing do you see this going forward that you, the way you uh supply and talk about the milk talk about w- uh, the ethical sourcing that you do that it becomes important in the way it gets consumed Yeah absolutely uh, in fact uh, you asked about James uh, Manoj also responded to the question on food labeling i i personally feel food labeling uh, is in the jurassic age uh, across the world uh, it's it's uh, food labeling is nowhere close to what it should be in terms of uh, a what people actually need and in it's way behind uh, the evolution of uh, everything else uh, that that we consume okay and uh, very clearly uh, uh, sort of stemming from there supply chains will need to be uh, rethought uh, across uh, for various reasons one is you know if you take food a uh, basic uh, as as a basic product the food security of a nation is suddenly now exposed to very different macro uh, risks which were uh, not factored in earlier so imagine if uh, you have a country importing uh, 90% of your food and suddenly that uh, stops which was always uh, taken for granted because of uh, uh, you know a, ma- a macro risk profile that imposes a lockdown of sorts across supply chains so those are those are pretty serious scenarios secondly the carbon footprint of what we eat today is immense uh, and uh, and and i think i think you know the, the discussion should actually be taken beyond uh, food as well i mean ultimately we are we are consumption society there are so many products there are so many services we consume today e- even the consumption of the internet uh, the carbon footprint of that is huge today i mean uh, it's it, it appears to us that uh, everything is uh, without any cost um, but the implication of that is is significant we need to understand that so i feel uh businesses really need to uh, address both of these pieces uh, very, very carefully uh, in terms of the way they are structured and that leads to wider discussion uh, like like we said uh, i mentioned about shareholder capitalism and secondly i think i think as consumers um, we really we have a lot of power in our hands uh, just like uh, democracy has uh, uh, this our power in uh, the hands of voters uh, you know some of us Uh, some people might think that they it, re- it really doesn't matter but it does matter uh, if if we make that effort right so just like that i think consumers have a lot of power uh, in in their hands in our hands we need to de- discern which are the brands and products that we consume the brands product services that we consume that are just doing purpose dressing as opposed to those brands and products that are actually being built in a purposeful way which have purposefulness in their dna and in fact much wider communities than just their shareholders if consumers became aware of this and this 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 has been going on for for quite some time for more than two decades now in in a very small way in terms of say fair trade in terms of some certain ethical sourcing partnerships and things like that we uh, we have in a very small limited way within our uh, the ecosystem our ethical ethical milk sourcing program but there is ethics in the value chain across everything that we consume and consumers can uh, really influence that with the choices uh, we make and and mm-hmm. I, i think that's something that can emerge uh, from this 
I want to pick up on two things that you just talked about uh, very quickly. One is that uh, the nature of consumption changing. Um, if we were to play that out, and I assume that you know, given the COVID experience, we've all learned that we can do with less, much less than we actually needed. And many, I've seen this around, many of us are learning that even after this is over, we're just all going to do with less. That's a massive change in the business environment. If you think of GDP driven by consumption. So when you think about planning, I mean, okay, you're in milk mantra, everybody will need milk. That's, you have a, um, a, that's a different market. But the idea of business planning in an environment where consumption patterns are going to shift so dramatically away, you know, becoming less. And second, coming to this point about, um, you know, a different kind of shareholder capitalism, uh, where people are going to be more inquisitive. As they're inquisitive about food, as they're inquisitive about news, now they're going to become more inquisitive about companies. Uh, how do you plan? How do you look ahead to the next quarter, next year? I wish I could pretend that I had the answer to that. Uh, but yeah, this is exactly the kind of uh, questions uh, that everybody needs to be, everybody is grappling with right now and needs to be thinking through very, very uh, clearly. So I think a few things. Uh, th there is clearly a demand impact uh, right now. Um, this kind of supply shock that's going on in a prolonged way will lead to some kind of a prolonged uh, demand uh, impact, uh, good or bad. Um, I, I think that that question uh, remains to be answered. Obviously, there's a lot of superfluous consumption, uh, which, which is not good. It's sort of being a highly cons consumption oriented society isn't the best way to live our lives. But clearly, we need consumption in various other aspects for, for the economy to be also uh, thriving. Having said that, I think in, in, this, in this new normal, uh, you know, people across major economies have now lived a life of lockdown. And we know habits form within 21 days. And we, we are going through several cycles of 21 days now. Will this have a prolonged impact on the way we consume? Yes, I think so. So from a planning perspective, I believe that there has to be a shift of the curve. Uh, businesses that were used to operating at, uh, with a curve at, say, an index of 100 will need to plan to be fully sustainable, viable at even 60%. Uh, of uh, that curve, and then that's that's a major shift in thinking, uh, in terms of sustainability, in terms of uh, scale, uh, and I think I think it's important from a business continuity planning to have that in our horizon very clearly, and of course everything uh, above that uh, as things pan out um, and responsible consumption goes up, it, it it goes straight away. You benefit from that. I think I think that's that's uh, one piece of it. I think the second piece related to this is about uh, kind of the, the absolute uh, vivid interconnectedness that has emerged uh, from this and in many ways. So as uh, business leaders, you cannot be sitting on the sidelines. I think you have to be engaging fully now and, and by that in very different contexts. Uh, you know, I'll share with you a, a small example. When we, when this, uh, when we kind of emerged into lockdown and suddenly started operating, we faced so many other challenges and we said, you know, what the hell is, uh, is this sort of the, the regulatory framework, the government, uh, the police, the administration, what are they doing? But when we started engaging with them, they were very helpful. You know, they wanted to come forward and say, what are your problems? Let's, let's solve it. And I haven't seen that responsiveness uh, earlier. And I think, uh, I, you know, from from a sort of business robustness, continuity planning, it's very important for leaders to have a much bigger sight of externalities and the interconnectedness that exists and be able to be engaging it in, with it very, very uh, clearly. The larger uh, problem around, uh, so the second part of your question, James, was around uh, the piece of uh, responsible capitalism. Yeah. So, yeah. No, I, I, I have always uh, been a sort of passionate uh, believer of uh, responsible, purposeful, conscious capitalism. The way, whichever way you, whichever term uh, you, you, you think about. And I think businesses, large businesses, startups that are starting out, everyone has to put purpose at the core of the business. Okay. If the dimensions 
of how businesses are valued will change and that will happen when consumers think differently how markets value you this change will automatically happen and responsible capitalism is has several dimensions i don't think we have time to kind of uh, get into the sort of details of it but i feel this is really the causal platform the dislocation that we needed of source to think back to sit back and think there have been of late in the last two years especially lot of thinking uh, around this um, aspect and this clearly provides us the opportunity to think about what the purpose of business is hmm. how can we shape the business model around that purpose and still be generating uh, fabulous returns for uh, shareholders but not at the expense of uh, uh, enhancing inequality or uh, sort of uh, uh, fostering more uh, adverse climate change so those which are two of the largest problems that uh, sort of face the world i i think business is a powerful force to make big change happen uh, to, to solve some of those large uh, uh, problems and if small businesses mid sized businesses and large corporations really put that purpose in focus and i think they will be compelled to do so now uh, then that change will happen and, and that's something where which will lead to a resetting of this capitalism which has to uh, happen for us to be able to shape the form of this uh, new model thanks <clears throat> Thank you, Sri. Uh, Govind, I want to come to you for one one last question. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Sri mentioned interconnectedness. So, it, with all the plethora of news that's out there and all the uncertainty that's going on that you had talked about, I want to share an experience. I tend to go to my uh, WhatsApp groups from people all over the world who give me on the ground information of what's true and real, and I find that that curated news is actually, in its personal experience. is actually more authentic more accurate and more recent than what i used to read in the press have we has the nature of the way news is going to be consumed generated and consumed and the closeness that i now have to the generation of it is that going to change uh james this is a very very uh, important question and uh, it's a in what you're saying is really the maybe the symptom of the disease the disease is that in some is that we've lost trust uh we do not trust uh, media or mainstream media anymore and we trust a lot of people including obviously uh people in our peer group who are knowledgeable intelligent at the place where you think that event is happening and therefore you trust them so uh, there are two parts to it one is uh, will people continue to trust in the near term those who they uh, are close to them one way or the other i think the answer is yes uh on the flip side i think uh, the challenge upon media organizations mainstream media organizations to get their act together so to speak and uh, use the skills that they have to objectively report on issues uh, on events on pandemics uh, as it might be is ever greater the uh, the ability of uh, i mean this is obviously with some bias the ability of a trained journalist to report objectively if that journalist is doing so is far greater than anyone to go and collect or if tomorrow there is a fire or there is a, a natural disaster it's not anyone's job to go there but it is a journalist job uh, if that mm. journalist is doing it well to go and report from the, the ground and report on things objectively ask people questions tough questions get answers pack put it all together and present it to an audience which could be you or me or whatever there is clearly a gap there now and uh, uh, and it i cannot answer it except to say that uh, if there is there is a trust gap and there is a trust deficit which people like me in media have to build uh, and repair and it's a long way to go i mean there is the the trust gap is so huge and so vast that it's not going to get filled in a, in a in a hurry so yeah till then i think unfortunately you will depend more on your uh friends and uh acquaintances unfortunately but and i it's my job to try and convince you otherwise <laughs> thank you and thank you all we're coming to the end of it i want to give each of you uh a quick one sentence question one thing that you have seen and changed in the last couple of months that you want to keep in the new world that's coming after all of this some change right that you say this should last Yeah I think I would say the the big change it's not a change but I think it's beginning to happen is critical thinking I think people uh, are hopefully beginning to be more skeptical more wary more suspicious more careful when it comes to consuming information hopefully that will continue and become stronger and better as we come out of this thank you I'll 
I'll build on what um, Govind said and say, use that critical thinking before you eat. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. Of course. Sri? I, I think I'll be a little bit more uh, sort of uh, literal on this. Uh, you know, somehow this lockdown, the way the world has shut also, is letting the earth, uh, allowing the earth to breathe. So I'm wondering whether a 15-day lockdown of the world uh, uh, annually uh, is something that uh, could happen uh, permanently in the, in the future for, for some time. Will it, will it have a big impact uh, on the way we live and the way the earth regenerates? Wow, wonderful. Thank you all, all three of you very, very much. It's just, it's wonderful talking to you at any time, but especially on this topic. We still haven't solved, have all the answers for what the road ahead looks like, but as all of you who are watching and listening have heard, we've got three people who have full of hope, even though there's been incredible turmoil in each of their sectors, there's hope that the news sector will finally get changed and we'll start to rebuild the trust effort that has been broken for such a long time. There's hope that the way we understand and consume food will actually be much richer, not just for our bodies, but also for the farmers who have been affected for so long. And there's hope that businesses will actually change the role for why they were, uh, why they were existing for all this time, right? That they will actually look at this and rethink uh, the way they are. And part of that hope is linked to this idea of interconnectedness that I don't want to lose that Sri mentioned, that uh, who we are as consumers and who we are as people needs to connect right back to the producers, that the chain is, can no longer be separate anymore. We have to know everything that happens all the way to the end. And I hope we can keep that going forward. Thank you all very much. Yeah. Thank you everyone for joining us today. And thank you, James. And hopefully the next time uh, we listen to you and uh, you're the third axis uh, with, uh, <laughs> with uh, energy and electricity, which will surely stay around for longer than news. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you, Govin. Um, we'll reserve that for another time. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank you.